Greetings, everyone. Thanks for coming to the operator training today. I'm Hannah Hickam, the executive assistant, and I will be your host for today. And um, before we get, well, while we get started, um, you can go ahead and start with the Q&A. We're gonna chat our questions in. And then also, um, I apologize, I put the wrong link on the website, but I fixed it. So it should be all good now. I'm sorry about that, guys. <laughs> And just, yeah, go ahead and chat your questions in and we'll get to those first thing and then we'll move on. Hannah, I've got that question, but we'll wait till more people pile in. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. good morning, Hannah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Jane. Everyone who's just joining us, we're um, in the Q&A portion of the agenda and you can chat your questions in. We're just waiting for some more folks to get on. The participant list is still climbing. So we wanna make sure everybody is on to hear the answer to the questions. And then we'll get right to the questions as soon as that levels out just a bit. Let's go, Hannah. All right, awesome. Uh, first question is, when can we expect guidance on 5A and submittal timing? Um, in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> Great, thanks, Jane. 
And next question is, when will there be guidance on the form to refile process? Couple of weeks. All right, next question is, any updates on e-forms? Things are moving quite slow and we are experiencing a seven to 10 minutes between validating and submitting on form 42s. I just uh, sent that on to the IT folks and they'll do whatever they can. Thank you. And uh, form 45 location construction report, is this applicable to locations built after January 15th? Yes, the answer is yes. All right, that's all the questions for now. Um, let's just keep it moving and then we'll hold all the rest of the questions to the end. Um, first up is Mike Leonard with the Emergency Response Plan and Operations Safety Management Program Plan. Give me a moment to make that transition. Oops, <laughs> just kidding. And uh, <laughs> you can take it away. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. Um, <laughs> I don't have I don't have a, a presentation for this this morning. We posted both of these um, guidance um, documents last week. Um, if anybody has any questions about them, I guess a couple things that are that are important to note that the, both of these are required for the new 2A, and they're required for any current location. So operators need to start thinking about um, developing these programs and and emergency response plans with local agencies. Um, I know there's a little bit of confusion about the term emergency response plan, because when you get into the response world, there's emergency response plans, there's tactical response plans and everything else. Um, the biggest takeaway from the emergency response plan is to start that conversation. The operators need to start that conversation with their local emergency response agencies to the level that those agencies want to um, contribute. Um, it, too often we've had um, incidents that the response agency, the, the emergency response agency had no idea what was going on on a location. And this is really an educational um, opportunity for them and for the operator to keep um, a lot of people safe and, and potentially keep um, things from, from uh, expanding. So with that, I was just gonna open it up to questions about the two plans um, and go from there. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I'll show you where these are located on the website. Um, under SB 19-181, and then the mission change guidance, I think. <laughs> and then they're down here. Oh, how about let's uh, use our control F to find. That is always helpful. It's farther down, Hannah. Here we go, emergency. There's the emergency there response plan. And then the other one is called operations. So there's, no, nope, that's not it. But if we click through, we can find operations notice. Nope, that's not it. Oh, nope, that's not it either. Well, it's on here. It's right there, you're there, you're there. Okay. Not that okay. one. This one, there it is. Yeah, that's the they're they're that one and the next one down. So you can use your um, control F to find it in all of this if you don't want to read through every single one of. Yeah. Those. So um, I'm assuming the question: What constitutes approval by the local government? I'm uh, I'm assuming that's for the emergency response plan. <laughs> Um, that's a written agreement or an agreement between the local government and the operator that they, they feel that the plans are adequate. Um, for operation safety management, we're asking for a written plan describing how we're potential threats. Um, broad and ambiguous, it says it's broad and ambiguous. Does COGCC intend to develop a template or example plan to assist, assist operators in better meeting expectations? Um, I would imagine we could. Um, it's going to be different in every case. That's, you know, that's kind of one of the reasons it's broad and ambiguous because it depends on the size of your operations and the ability of, of the local responders. So a one, one well, one tank situation is different than a multi-well situation. Uh, 
for the safety management plan states any major modifications, then the definition of, of process is for any equipment. There are many minor modifications to equipment such as surface wellhead flow lines, pipelines. How is major modification determined? Um, I thought we defined that, but maybe we did not. We probably need to get a, a definition in there of major modification. Um, I do know that if um, uh, part of the answer in the um, Q&A was if, if you're making modifications, um, contact your, your OGLA to see if they would fit into a major modification. So for instance, if you're changing out, you know, um, um, tanks and treaters and things like that, separators, that would probably be considered a major modification. But we could probably define that a little bit better if, if need be. Hey, hey, Mike, this is Greg Duranlo, environmental manager. Um, you know, we use significantly modified substantive modifications and major modifications in various places throughout our rules. Um, if there are questions as to a case-by-case -case application of those rules, contact the appropriate COGCC staff. So in some cases, that is the OGLA specialist. In some cases, that would be the environmental protection specialist. In some cases, that might be the um, integrity unit uh, on flow lines. In some cases, that might be the field inspection unit. Um, so, you know, those are used throughout. We, we don't devi define those terms individually um, because they do tend to be a case-by-case -case determination. Thanks, Greg. And it looks like the questions have stalled, but just in case someone is typing out a really long one, we'll give them another minute or two. You hit the nail on the head, Hannah. <laughs> As I'm psychic. Uh, wildcat operations are changing very I guess wildcat operations are changing frequently. It would be changes. I mean, you have your, you should have your, your um, equipment and everything laid out on the 2A. If you're changing, changing from that, that's going to be a major modification. Yeah, and I think we have established some, some guidance, um, you know, and rules of thumb uh, that are that are already established and, and being used. Um, I, I don't think we will write a definition of what major modification is. Still waiting for that long typing. Well, that could have been it, but you never know. Just give folks another few minutes to put their questions in. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and queue up Jane's presentation while we're doing that. Yeah, that'd be fine. Cause we can always come back to this. I'll be here. Fun guys, my screen just died. <laughs> I guess, can you still see uh, Jane's? Oh, there, it came back to life. <laughs> oh, we've got a few more questions. <clears throat> Trying to find my unmute button here. Um, the 2A may be filed years in advance of a facility being built. Will the COGCC consider that time sensitive information in the plan may be outdated by the time the facility is put into operation? 
yes, uh, we will consider that. Um, and that's why, you know, we have uh, the Form 42's notice of construction um, and that gives our staff an opportunity to, to review things at that time. Um, that's also why we have a uh, effective time period for our for the for the permit applications um, once they're approved. They're only affected, uh, effective, effective, um, you know, for the three years. Um, and then if they get refiled after that, they, um, you know, they're subject to a new review. Okay. Um, would converting a legacy well from a plunger lift to a pumping unit invoke any requirements? Uh, the requirement would be for you to update, upgrade your, your internal plan and have it ready because you're, you're making major modifications. Um, it, putting a pumping unit on a location is probably not going to expand it. And I'm going to let Greg take that, expand it to a point where, and a legacy well probably doesn't have a two A, but I don't want to go too far into that. I'll let Greg throw some more into that. Yeah, I mean, I think the an operator could look at um, you know what those what those changes imply for the folks around. Uh, obviously, um, you know the uh, prime mover on a on a pumping unit can be. Um, you know, a loud engine that can cause noise concerns for things in which, you know, for, for neighbors, in which case that might be considered a, a significant change. Um, but generally speaking, I would say the mechanism for, you know, uh, producing the fluids isn't, isn't going to be um, a significant change. Um, but updating a multi well facility where you go from, you know, if you've got 12 wells and then you bring on 12 pump jacks later on in the, in the life of the wells, uh, that's maybe a significant change. So again, I would say that's why it's site specific and case by case and contact COGCC staff. Okay, uh, there seems to be some overlap between emergency spill response plan, fluid leak detection plan, emergency response plan, and operation safety management program plan. Please elaborate where the similarity should be handled as not to be duplicative. Um, there's a lot in that question. Uh, I think it's going to be, it, it's going to depend on what incidents you're trying to address. Um, your emergency spill response plan, you know, a lot of those uh, deal with waters of the state, things like that, which may may or may not roll into your emergency response plan with your local with your local agencies um, if if they're part of that then yes that's um, you know that's all in one um, the operation safety management program again that's all about your equipment and your and your ongoing operations um, making sure that the when you're making changes you're documenting those changes and and they are the appropriate changes. I don't know if that's completely answered that question, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think one way also to look at that is, is maybe those are different chapters in a, in a larger book of, of planning documents. Um, you know, the fluid leak detection plan is what you're doing on your own site and your um, staff are doing when they're when they're on site to ensure that they're um, you know finding and and repairing um, you know any liquid leaks that that they find on site um, during their routine operations the emergency spill response plan is obviously when things go um, significantly wrong and you know your notifications um, to downstream public water supply um, or public water system uh, providers etc um, emergency response plan, obviously working with your, um, your local emergency responders and the operation safety management program is really your in, a, a, another internal um, document, I believe. So, you know, each, each plan has a different, a different purpose and a different audience. Um, and so, yes, there may be some overlap between them, but I don't believe that makes them du duplicative or redundant. Okay. 
Uh, in La Plata County, EPP are updated annually per local code fieldwide. How should operators provide the specific wells, equipment, and et cetera? Part of the, um, uh, the rule and the, and the guidance says that you can do these, um, operators can do these on a, on a fieldwide basis if the um, local government and the local emergency response is um, acceptable to that. So um, you don't necessarily provide, I mean, you, you already have that in your plan in a fieldwide plan, so that's, that's acceptable. Um, has the COGC communi communicated with local fire departments to ensure they're prepared to respond to all operator inquiries? Um, we have talked to, to some um, response agencies. Um, actually, I'm talking to the uh, Colorado Response Network on Thursday. Um, and again, it's, it's up to the, it's, it, it, all the operator has to do is reach out it's up to the local response agency on how they want to respond. If they don't want to be involved, um, they don't have to be involved. They don't have to give that information. And then the operator needs to come back and say, you know, basically we tried, but the response agency um, didn't give us that information. I think the next, um, and uh, the next question goes a little bit farther, asks if there are required timeframes do they have a time frame for approval? No, again, that's we left that open so that the the response agency has the the power and the authority there. They're they're the ones that are going to respond. Um, again, this was not meant to be um, the COGCC trying to step in, making your response um, plans. It's start that conversation with your response agency. Make sure they understand. Um, what they're walking into. A field-wide plan, yeah, is, uh, if a field-wide plan is then, how many of the plan would not be applicable? Is it okay not to follow the guidance so we do not need an approved plan from the, uh, if the response agent, if, if your local response agencies don't want to participate, there's, there's not a lot that we can do. We can't force that response agency to participate. Um, you just need to show documentation that they, they weren't willing to participate. All right. Well, it looks like the questions have come to uh, cease. <laughs> so um, we'll just move on. Any questions that come in after that, we'll just answer them at the end. So no worries there, guys. And um, if you have any questions that you think of during the next presentation or for this presentation, you can just um, chat them in and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, so next up, we have Jane Stanzik with the Form 9 Transfer of Operatorship. Uh, Jane, you can take it away. Thank you, Hannah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jane Stanzik, the permitting manager. Um, I'm going to fly through a lot of information on the new Form 9 transfer of operatorship. But just to give you a heads up, it is not released yet in eForms. Um, it may be released later this week. I hope it will be. Um, but this is a good timing to go ahead and let you know what's coming and to give you some um, resources to start preparing for when the Form 9 is available. I understand that transactions have been happening and folks are um, in need of submitting their Form 9s. Um, so I think some of the information I give you today will uh, give you a place to get started until the nine is released. Um, next slide, please, Hannah. So uh, the mission change rules replace the old change of operator process with a new process called transfer of operatorship. And the rule includes, it's rule eight, 218. It includes a lot of details for the process and for the form itself. 
Um, I'm just going to highlight some new aspects to the uh, transfer of operatorship process. Uh, it requires two forms, a Form 9 intent and then a Form 9 subsequent. Um, because the Form 9 intent is filed prior to a transfer, uh, there's an option to uh, request confidentiality for the, that information. If you're in the midst of um, negotiations for a, a sale purchase. Um, the next two things I've highlighted in red because these are big changes, at least from my perspective. Um, the forms will have to include uh, lists of related wells and facilities and incidents that are not being transferred. And along with that, um, an operator with compliance responsibility for those related things that are not being transferred to the buyer will have to be identified. Um, also, there's the option to have a compliance plan as part of the transfer approval for any um, permits that are not, at the time of transfer, are not in compliance with the current rules. And um, another new element is that the buying operator will need to notify um, all local relevant local governments of the transfer. Next slide, Hannah. So the Form 9 intent process, it's outlined here, the selling operator files the Form 9 intent 30 days if possible prior to the transfer. Um, and that form includes an anticipated date of transfer an estimated amount of bonding from the buyer, the lists of wells, facilities, and incidents that are proposed to be transferred, a list of everything that's related to those that will not be transferred, and a signed attestation from both operators as to the information on that nine intent. Um, staff will review, of course, the estimated financial assurance and um, notify the buying office operator if it appears that that's inadequate. Uh, staff will review the, the lists of items to be transferred and the related items that will not be transferred. If those lists are incomplete or inaccurate, the form will be returned to draft. Staff will look at the attachments um, and if they're inadequate or missing, the form will be returned to draft. The Form 9 intent remains in process um, when it's complete. Um, and of course, um, as is often the case, the buying operator uh, will provide additional financial assurance um, while the Form 9 intent is in process and before the Form 9 subsequent is filed. Next slide, please, Hannah. So now this is the Form 9 subsequent process. The buying operator submits the Form 9 subsequent within seven days of the transfer. And that form's going to include the effective date of the transfer, the buying operator's financial assurance that has already been provided, the lists of wells, facilities, and incidents that are transferred, the lists of everything that's related to those that were not transferred and the operator that is responsible for compliance for those things. Um, and sometimes it's possible that um, wells or facilities were listed on the intent as proposed and then it turns out that you didn't transfer those. Um, those need to be accounted for and again, um, a operator responsible for compliance needs to be identified for those. Um, the rules require the buying operator to acknowledge subsequent liability. I'll show you that in a minute on the form. Um, there is an attestation again, signed by both operators, um, confirming all the information on the submitted form nine subsequent. Um, sometimes you will need an attestation for retained responsibility by the seller. Um, the buyer will have to attest to notification of relevant local governments. 
and there may be a compliance plan. Next slide, Hannah. So staff will do the same thing. They'll review the financial assurance of the buyer um, for compliance with the 700 series. They will review all the lists. Um, if they're incomplete or inaccurate, the form will be returned to draft. Um, staff will determine if the any of the permits being transferred are in compliance with rules in effect at the time of transfer and staff will review the attachments. So the transfer, um, is approved when um, the nine intent and the nine subsequent are complete and accurate. Um, when the buying operator's financial assurance is in compliance with the requirements, all the lists and attachments are complete and um, all the transferred permits are either deemed to be in compliance with the rules in effect at the time or a satisfactory compliance plan has been submitted. Um, and then the form nine intent and the subsequent are approved simultaneously. Next slide, please, Hannah. So when a transfer is approved, there's um, some more things that the buying operator will need to do. Um, they'll need to file a form 10 for any wells that were transferred to de designate their transporters and gatherers. Um, if, if a open spill or release has been transferred, they have to submit um, a, for, a supplemental form 19 to designate uh, the responsible operator. And the same thing if an open remediation project um, is transferred, they will have to submit a supplemental 27 to designate the responsible operator. And I've given you the rule references to help you track that all down. Um, next slide, please, Hannah. So um, there's some instances where the transfer will not be approved. So it's possible that a Form 9 intent is submitted prior to uh, the conclusion of a transfer, and then the transfer doesn't happen. If that's the case, the selling operator notifies staff with an email and staff simply withdraws the nine intent. Um, but the director may uh, deny a form nine intent and subsequent, um, and the selling operator will remain responsible for compliance if the um, forms are not complete and accurate if the buying operator does not provide adequate financial assurance, um, and if a Form 9 subsequent is not submitted um, within 120 days after the anticipated date of transfer that was on the Form 9 intent. Next slide, please, Hannah. So I'm gonna fly through some pictures of the uh, Form 9. Um, so here's the wizard to create a form nine and just as the rules dictate, only the selling operator can submit the intent, only the buying operator can submit the subsequent and the e-form document number of the intent that's in process um, is required to submit the, to create the nine subsequent. Next slide, please, Hannah. So, um, there's an operator's info tab on both forms, and this is what the one for the intent looks like. Um, the type of form, intent, or subsequent is auto-populated from the wizard. The, for the intent, the selling operator information is auto-populated, so you'll provide a contact for the seller. You'll have to identify the buying operator um, and a contact person for the buying operator. Next slide, Hannah. This is the transfer information tab um, on the intent. You'll enter the anticipated date of transfer. The effective date is grayed out. That's only for the subsequent. Uh, you'll indicate yes or no for confidentiality of this intent. Um, you will provide uh, the estimated amount of financial assurance um, on the intent and then that actual financial assurance is um, 
grayed out on the intent because that's for the subsequent. Next slide, please, Hannah. Um, and so the attachments for the intent, the required attachment is the Form 9 Intent Attestation. Um, you can look at um, the rule to see what that is all about. And then it's possible that there would be a compliance plan attached. Next slide, please, Hannah. So now we'll go through the same tabs for the subsequent. Again, subsequent is checked because you checked it out on the wizard. Um, and the, the corresponding um, form nine intent document number is populated. The selling operator information is blank because this form is being submitted by the buyer. So you'll have to uh, select the correct selling operator. Um, and of course, contact information for the seller. The buying operator is auto-populated from the wizard and you'll have contact info for the buying operator. Next slide, please, Hannah. So here's the transfer information tab again. Um, so you see that the, in, the um, anticipated date of transfer is auto-populated. Um, you'll be required to put in the effective date. The confidentiality answer from the intent is auto-populated. The point is moot at this time. Um, the uh, subsequent nine does, is not confidential. It's, hap it's submitted after the transfer. Um, so the estimated amount of financial assurance from the intent is auto-populated. Um, and for the subsequent, you have to submit um, all the appropriate uh, financial assurance for the buying operator. Next slide, please, Hannah. This is um, the subsequent liability tab. It, you'll see it on both forms, but on the intent, uh, these boxes are grayed out. You cannot check them. Um, this is required by rule. In fact, these are, um, these are the rules quoted, exact language. Um, and um, the buying operator has to check to acknowledge all of this. Otherwise, the subsequent is not complete. Next slide, please, Hannah. Um, here are the attachments for the subsequent form. Um, the attestation of, of notification of the buying operator of the by the buying operator notification to the relevant local governments. There's a form nine subsequent attestation. Um, in some cases, the seller will attest to retaining compliance responsibility. And in some cases, there'll be a compliance plan. Next slide, please, Hannah. So, with all that, now to talk about the things that the transfer of operatorship is actually ap applicable to. What, what is being transferred? So um, this is right out of the rules. Like I said, the rule is real specific about all the aspects of this process. Um, so here's all the things that are transferred with a form nine. Um, and um, right out of the rule. Next slide, please, Hannah. So there's two types of things to be transferred. There are permits, there are existing wells, facilities, locations, flow lines, um, pits, all kinds of things. But those are things um, and there are also what we're lumping together to call incidents. And these are again, right out of the rule, though the rule doesn't call them incidents, but we are calling them incidents because they have different information than the wells and facilities in the database. They're just different things. And so the incidents are open remediation projects, unresolved spills, unresolved corrective actions, unresolved warning letters and unresolved um, NOAVs. Next slide, please, Hannah. 
So the form nine intent has up to four lists, a list of wells and facilities, and that includes locations uh, proposed for transfer, a list of incidents proposed for transfer, and then the corresponding lists of wells and facilities and incidents that are related to things that will be transferred but these related things will not be transferred. And it's important to note the old Form 10, if you listed a well on an old Form 10 change of operator, when it was approved, it automatically changed the operator on the location. And that is no longer going to happen. So if you're transferring a well and a location, you have to list both of them uh, separately on the form. Um, so on the form nine and 10, there's a tab, a separate tab for each list. Next slide, please, Hannah. So here are the lists for the subsequent. Um, they're pretty much the same as those for the intent, except it's already happened. It's not, things aren't being proposed. So it's what got transferred, a list of wells and facilities, a list of incidents. What's related to those things that were transferred but are not being transferred? A list of wells, a list of incidents. Then, like I said, it's possible that the intent listed something that ended up not being part of the final deal. Um, and so if that's the case, there'll be a list of those things. Um, and again, the wells and facilities are listed separately from the incidents because they're different. Um, and it's also possible that the intent came in with five wells. And when the, the, all the negotiations are over, it turns out that six wells are being transferred. That's fine. They're going to be here. They weren't on the intent. That's fine. So again, on the form nine subsequent, there is a tab for each list. Next slide, please, Hannah. So this is just a, a look at kind of the organization of each of these list tabs. They have a title to help you keep track of what page you're on, what tab you're on. There's a summary section that will summarize the data once you've imported it. Um, there's a button to download a blank template and then of course to import it. There's a button to view the imported data and to clear the data. Next slide, please, Hannah. So um, this just shows you pictures of the buttons for the different templates. So there's a, temp a separate template for each list um, on each separate tab. Um, the templates for wells and facilities on the intent, this um, just shows all the columns um, in that template. And then the templates for the incidents, again, it shows the columns for the information. And I think this might give you some idea as to why they're separate, because they have totally different types of information. Next slide, please, Hannah. So same thing for the um, subsequent, there's six potentially six lists um, for the wells and facilities transferred and this incidents transferred. The, the template is the same as on the intent, the same columns. Next slide, please, Hannah. But here is where it's different. So I out highlighted this in red at in one of the earlier slides and it's in red again. So, um, the templates for things that are related or that were proposed and are not being transferred, they have all the same columns, all the same data, plus you have to specify the operator who has compliance responsibility for those things. So that is for both wells and facilities and for incidents. And I've given you the rule citations there if you wanna go look that up. Next slide, please, Hannah. Okay, so lots of lists, 
lots of things to check and double check, making sure all the things that are related are accounted for um, to help you do that. Um, there are some tools and the, where you access those tools are on the form nine instructions page on the website. Next slide, please, Hannah. So when you click on that link, it takes you to this page. Um, and so there's three different tools. One is for related wells and facilities. One is for related incidents and one is for incidents by operator. Next slide, please, Hannah. So this is what the related wells and facilities tool looks like. Um, you enter search values. So if you're going to transfer a location, you put the location in here. Um, or if you're gonna transfer a well or wells, you put the API numbers in here. You can fill both of these boxes with search values so that you are able to get a report of everything that's related. So you, nothing falls through the crack. Um, so next slide, please, Hannah. Oh no. Hannah, you're not gonna like this, but I've got my slides out of order and we're gonna have to go, can you go backwards when I tell you? Yeah, totally, yeah. All right, go forward. I'm so sorry. Okay. Go forward totally. again. Okay. I, my bad, totally bad. Okay. Totally fine. All right, so on that, in that search value box, I entered two location IDs. That's all I put in there. This is the report that's generated. So in that column that says item one, item one is everything that's related to that search value, that three, three, four, five, 10 location ID. And everything in item two is all the things that are related to that other location ID number. Um, so they're listed alphabetically by facility type and everything that's available in the database is populated in this report. Um, and you can export it to Excel. Next slide, please, Hannah. Oh, you're gonna have to go next. Next. Are you going forward or backwards, dear? Sorry, I went forward once and then I went backwards. Um, so oh. this is the slide after the one you were just on. Go forward one more, please. Okay. All right, and this is the export from the related wells and facilities. Um, so th this will help you prepare all of the different wells and facilities lists, the two for the intent, the three for the subsequent. Next slide, please. But, there's a but. So we included in this uh, report and of course then in this export, um, three columns that we thought would help the buyer and the seller figure out what's being transferred. So those three extra help columns are H is the status of the well or facility, I is the status date, and column P is an indication if it's a well that whether or not it's inactive. Um, column B is, was necessary because you needed to see what the results were for each of the search values that you entered. So before you copy and paste anything out of this export, into a template, you have to remove these columns. Otherwise, the template is not happy and it won't import. And you're also gonna to have to renumber in column A, um, remember that the report puts the same number, one number repeated for each search value, each group of results for a search value. Um, you're gonna to wanna to take out those numbers and go one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so that's just a caution. Um, 
I guess one thing to note about um, the inactive, we put that in because often a transfer involves a number of inactive wells and inactive wells can trigger the need for additional financial assurance. So form 10s would come in and financial assurance folks would review the 10 and identify many inactive wells and contact the buyer and say, dear buyer, you are, have just purchased 25 inactive wells. You don't have adequate financial assurance. You, and that of course then can hold up the transfer. We're giving you this information upfront so that the buyer and seller can figure out what's going to be transferred and the buyer can calculate accurately their financial assurance before the form is submitted. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. Okay, now you, I need you to go backwards. I'm super sorry. No, it's totally okay. All right, let's see. One, two, three, four. It's got to be one of these. Oh, that's it. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. So the, the tool for related incidents works exactly the same as the tool for the related um, wells and facilities. So I'm only gonna show you now how the tool for the operator incidents works. So you enter an operator number, probably the selling operator. Next slide, please, Hannah. And this is the report page that opens for that search. Um, I've covered up the actual operator and document number so no one feels picked on, but um, this is the result. It, they're listed in order by document number. And of course there's an export to Excel. Next slide, please, Hannah. Next slide, please. And this is the Excel export for uh, operator incidents. And you can use this to prepare any of the incidents lists um, for the intent or for the subsequent. Next slide, please, Hannah. Keep going, keep going, great. Oh, oh, no, no, back. So, um, here again, we're on the Form 9 instructions page on the website. And at the under data templates, the first thing listed is not a template. It is that link to the instructions. Below that are listed blank templates. Um, this is only a partial list, but the whole list will be there. Um, so until the Form 9, is released in eForms, you can um, use the tools and start building your templates, populating your templates in preparation for importing them to the Form 9 when the, when the form is finally ready. Um, next slide, please, Hannah. So some tips for creating your lists. Um, like other e-forms that have templates, um, it's better to use a new template rather than copying and refilling um, an old spreadsheet. Sometimes that corrupts the file and it uh, prevents it from importing successfully into e-forms. Um, I suggest you use the operator tools to help create lists that are accurate and complete. Um, if you use the related incidents tool, you cannot use it alone. You have to use it with the operator incident list. Um, the related incident, incident list will always be incomplete due to the way that things are related in the database. Um, so we've provided it, it might be helpful, but you might but don't ever use it without the operator incident list. Um, please limit the size of the proposed transfer lists. Um, 
you know that we've asked that for years on the form 10 change of operator that you not submit a thousand items in one form that you submit 10 forms with a hundred each to uh, in the case of a really large transfer. The reason is it e-forms times out um, if, it's, if there's too much in it. Um, so we're asking for this new form nine that when you build your intent that the transfer lists, there's again, one for wells and facilities and one for incidents that you don't have more than 150 items on each of those lists for one form nine intent. Um, and when you're then submitting a subsequent, you need to maintain that one-to-one -one correspondence between what was submitted on an intent and what then comes in on the subsequent for that intent. Um, and again, the document number of the intent, you enter that in the wizard when you start, when you create the subsequent and it's displayed on the um, operator information tab on the subsequent. Um, next slide, please, Hannah. So um, who is going to help answer questions about the form nine? Um, if you have questions about the tools like if they don't seem to work, if they lock up, if you have trouble, please email Bryce Holder. He built those tools for us um, and he's the expert. As to what information to put on the, on your, on the form, uh, how to prepare the attachments and the lists and the templates, um, you can email me or Terry or Scott Cuthbertson. And I think that's my last slide. Next slide, please, Hannah. Yep, that's it. So. Awesome, thank you, Jane. Um, would you like me to read the questions out loud? That would be great, Hannah. All right, um, I think the Dave Coleman one was for Mike, um, but I think Mike might have answered that one and same with Amanda, so let's see. Uh, if a location or well is PNA, do they need to be listed as not being transferred? I think that might be for. That depends on the status of the reclamation. If a location has been closed and the well's been plugged and abandoned, but it has not passed a final reclamation inspection, it has to be accounted for. So it's either transferred to the buyer or the seller retains the compliance responsibility until it has passed a final reclamation inspection. All right, thank you, Jane. Uh, the next question, what is the process of a form nine and 10 is filed, but the sale does not close and the deal is scrapped? Um, this, the, so the seller has submitted that intent. Um, that operator just emails uh, Terry Ikenoe and says the deal was scrapped and Terry will, will withdraw that intent from eForms. Great, thank you. And we have a hypothetical. Um, please advise what would happen in this scenario. Consultation has occurred with the local government agency, CPW and COGCC. The permit is obtained from the local governmental agency, but when the 2A is submitted with the ALA and the COGCC determines a location in the ALA is not what the local agency selected. Oh, sorry, it just moved. Sorry, the COGCC determines a location and the ALA is not what the local agency selected is deemed to be the best. Would that mean the two agencies differ in preferred location? Who wins? Hey, Jane, that question doesn't yeah. pertain to your talk. I will, no. I will gladly take that question. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Um, so the intent of the pre-application consultation between the operator, local government, and COGCC is ultimately to come to an agreement on the preferred location, um, if at all possible. And so, you know, using the information from the ALA prior to the operator submitting their Form 2A to the state, um, this would ensure that when the 2A um, with the ALA come into eForms, staff has already 
reviewed and discussed it with both the operator and the local government. Um, so no surprises would be likely. And you know, therefore the operators should um, keep the ALA process in mind and at the forefront of their siting efforts from the start. Um, when they are looking at locations from which to develop minerals, they should be using the alternative location criteria as a, as a planning tool. Um, ultimately, um, you know, a form 2A that's submitted comes before our commission for a decision. And, um, you know, if that's in conflict with what the local government, um, you know, approved, we are trying to make that scenario as unlikely as possible. Great. Thank you, Greg. Uh, the next question is, my experience has been that transfer of wells from one operator to another has taken several months. Has anything been done to speed up this process? Um, yeah, that's a really great question. It does take months. Um, and here's why. The old Form 10, what was provided to staff, to the commission, was a list of things to be transferred. And so staff would review that list and find many, many related items. So then the question is, well, what about these related items? So then staff would go back to the buyer and seller and say, hey, what about these related items? And then the buyer would say, I don't want that. And the seller would say, oh, you have to take that or whatever. So negotiations would continue. Staff would be waiting for that to be sorted out in an acceptable fashion. The rule and the form now put that responsibility for identifying everything that's related and accounting for it to the seller and the buyer. And that's why there's a list for related not being transferred. And on the subsequent related not being transferred and who's going to be responsible for compliance. So, um, we hope that that um, change in the process will help us process forms more quickly. The other thing is, that holds up the um, review is the financial assurance piece. And I kind of pointed this out. A Form 10 is submit, used to be submitted. It had 20 inactive wells on it. The buyer had no idea that they were inactive. The buyer had no idea that they would have to bond up a considerable amount to, um, in order to have those wells. Again, that part is um, by having the form in nine and 10, um, that's up more up front. Um, and hopefully there won't be any surprises. And when the form Sub, form nine subsequent is filed, the, um, the financial assurance is all in place. The buyer is already bonded. So um, I hope that will speed up the process. We'll see. <clears throat> Thank you, Dane. Uh, the next question is, can we get an export of related and operator wells and facilities and incidents now while waiting on the form nine? I think I said that. So those tools are, they're available. You can go there right now and start doing it. And the templates are available. You can start preparing templates, you can start sorting it all out. Um, would you like me to navigate on the website where that is just in case folks don't That'd know? That'd be cool. Okay, yeah. second, let me pull this over. Thank you, Hannah. I'm gonna look away for a second because my screen's over here. Uh, all right, so. Here's our homepage. Tell me where to go. Uh, click on regulation. All right. And click on forms. And click on form nine, transfer of operatorship. And right there under the templates, that very first item is not a template, it is the Operator, the tools, click there. There's the tools, they're up and running. And Hannah, if you could go back, please. 
And you can see that um, the templates are there, the four different templates for the form nine intent and the six different templates for the form nine subsequent. So they're all available. Um, you can open them, start building them. It's all there. Awesome, thanks Jane. Yeah, let me just put that. Well, I'll leave that up for just a minute. Um, the next question is, do we need to submit a list of corrective actions that are not complete to the COGCC or does that list go to the buying operator only? Hmm, so um, one of the things that can be transferred um, is in the, inc the group that we're calling incidents um, are the unresolved corrective actions that in most cases would be related to a well or facility or location that's being transferred. Um, and if they are, if that responsibility, that operatorship for, of that incident is being transferred, that incident is listed on the form nine. It's listed on the intent and then it's listed on the subsequent. And um, when the transfer is approved, it's transferred to the new operator. So it's, it's part of the process. I hope that answers the question. It's right. part of the transfer, it gets transferred. Thanks, Jane. Uh, the next question, how does the ALA process apply to a situation where the operator has a permit in process pre-January 2021 and owns the parcel where the well is to go? Jane, we're jumping back to um, Form 2A thing, so I'll jump back in. Thanks, Jane. Um, the, um, the permit, you know, the, the pre-January pre 2021 permit must be replaced and it's subject to our current permitting rules. Um, including the requirements to perform an alternative location analysis. With respect to the property being owned by the operator, um, while that does grant an operator a right to construct an oil and gas location on their property, it doesn't override the outcome of an alternative location analysis. So COGCC staff will still consider um, the full scope and scale of a ALA. Thank you, Greg. Uh, next question is, what roles do the third party contractor slash subcontractors have on locations with regards to emergency response plans? Do they need to have an equivalent plan in place to be reviewed by the operator and do contingency plans need to be reviewed and approved as well? Jane, I don't think this one's yours either. Um, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so, um, COGCC doesn't have jurisdiction over uh, third-party contractors. However, we do require that the operators train their employees under 602, uh, train employees, including subcontractors, uh, or ensure that the subcontractors have the training that's adequate to have a safe operation. We would hope that um, the subcontractors and the operator would get together and, and, and compare their plans to make sure that they, they line up, but we wouldn't want a subcontractor to have one plan going one direction and an operator having another plan going a, a different direction. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next question is, I just tested the tools and they are not working. Let's go try. Uh, Jane, those tools were <laughs> this one, right? And then let's see, who, sh I guess, can some, hmm. how would I test this? Oh, Jane, you're muted. Sorry. Go to the API box number. Okay. Number box, sorry. And type in 123-12345. Mm -hmm. And then hit search. And then, huh, it didn't work. That's weird because it just worked for me. Um, you know, it's, it just got launched out there last night. Um, I'll check with Bryce and he'll get it all up and running. 
Awesome. Thank you, Jane. Sorry yeah. about that. Oh, you know, things happen. Um, all right, it looks like the questions have ceased, but we'll give folks a few more minutes to get their questions in. Hey, Hannah, while we're while we're waiting on that, I'd like to circle back to a question that was that was asked in in earlier um, in the discussion regarding you know sort of compliance with guidance documents, and I I want to you know make sure that everyone everyone understands that guidance documents are just that. Um, they're COGCC staff guidance for how we would generally like to see compliance with the rules. Um, the regulated community, you the operators have asked us to provide guidance to help you comply and the commission directed staff to prepare various guidance documents. Um, but the guidance documents don't supplant the rules. They're not a replacement for the rules and ultimately compliance is measured against the rules, not against a guidance document. Um, so, you know, a guidance document is going to be appropriate and work in 90%, 80%, 95% of the circumstances, but possibly not all. And if you feel that your cir circumstances are those kind of special cases that guidance does not apply, then please reach out to staff and, and work with us through those circumstances. But again, at the end of the day, compliance with the rules is not optional. And that's where your compliance is measured is against the rules. So I just wanna, wanna stress that point um, that the guidance documents may not always work, but we feel that in the vast majority of cases, they will. Thank you, Greg. Um, Terry just, texted us, so I'm going to try what she said to do. Give me just a minute. Which one is it? Oh, it's not this one. So we'll start from scratch. Sorry, Terry, I tried, um, but we'll get that working folks. Thank you um, for letting us know about that. Um, I'm sure we'll get working on that. It looks like uh, most of the questions have come to a cease. Um, hey, so Hannah, in, in what you just did, does there need to be a dash in there? Go, go back. I did the dash the first time and it didn't work then. So I think oh. you might've thought that maybe the dash no. oh. the second. I'm sorry. No dash maybe, but. So just Hannah, go, if you go there, no, Bryce's Bryce has provided the formatting, and for oh, an API you. number, there is a dash. If you look in the gray, yeah, still okay. We'll fix it. But no hurt in trying something. You never know what will work. Um, here is. Yeah, the next operator training uh, will be. Oh, just ahead. to throw a kink in the works, it worked for me. No, know, it worked for me too. I don't. So one thing that we all need to try is to refresh. It's a new tool. It's a new link. Same thing with all those templates. You might want to refresh your browser. You might want to clear your cache. Those are all the things I try to <laughs> I try to get new things to work. I have not cleared my cookies in a while either. So that could always be an issue. Um, someone I, made another suggestion. So I'm just going to go try that real quick. No, it needs the dash. Bryce built it to need the dash. Oh. Mike says no. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> no, um, but, um, the gentleman, I think, uh, thank you, Mike McKenna. He suggested that I had a trailing space and that was what messed this one up this last time. And so, oh, and then somebody else said it worked for them using the dash. So <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm you know guessing what? Bryce is smarter than the average cat and accommodated both. <gasps> All right. Maybe well, so. If there's any issues, reach out to Bryce. <laughs> there you go. Um, he will fix that. 
Um, and then be careful about pasting and getting that trailing space because that's what messed me up the second time here. So that's um, some fun troubleshooting for everyone there. And so um, my slides were out of order and I will um, um, fix the slides and then we'll get that presentation posted. Um, Later, later today or tomorrow, our, usually, our usual timing of a day or so to get everything out on the website. Thanks, Jane. Um, we have a pretty long question here for Greg, so I will try to read it well. <laughs> um, with the statement by Greg, generally how COGCC would like to see compliance and do not replace the rules. The guidance includes an EPP 16 statements of what the EPP should include. The rule is each operator will have a functioning emergency response plan that provides for the effective management of situations that may arise from oil and gas operations. All existing and proposed oil and gas locations will have an emergency response plan in place that has been coordinated with and approved by the local emergency response agency. The plan may be developed to cover all oil and gas locations within a field or geographical area, so long as the emergency response agency agrees. I don't know where the question uh, uh, I do. I, I, I might maybe take a stab at this and Christy, if I'm wrong, say something. But so the, I think the question becomes much like um, the WOGLA process in Well County. If the operator has a plan through the county, okay, and it's a field-wide plan, that's acceptable, and, and Greg, stop me if I'm wrong, but that is the documentation we would want on the 2A saying, we have this approved plan through the county. Yeah, the only thing I would add is, you know, as sort of a baseline, the the 16 points in the guidance document are are the type of information we are looking for in a plan. Um, and so, you know, if the plan developed with the county falls woefully short of that, then it it won't be acceptable, and we'll we'll request additional information from the operator. Um, if the plan you know, if it's 15 of the 16 points because the 16th doesn't apply, then great. If they're in a different order, then fine. But if if there's two of those, you know, expected items listed in the in the plan that was approved by the the county, then we're gonna we're gonna need to have a discussion with the operator about that. Thanks, guys. I hope that answered the question. If it didn't, just uh, chat back to us and. Let us know um, how we can clarify. Uh, next question is, in the Form 9 tool, I got it to work, but it appears there is a limit, there's a limit to the number of records. Can you confirm the limit number? Um, you know, Jeff, I asked Bryce that yesterday, and I don't think I got the answer. Since I've got to fix my slides, I will get the answer, and I'll add it to the slide of the, um, the maximum number so I think you're talking about um, search values, a limit on the number of search values. Okay, let me get that. Like I said, I wondered that too, and then I didn't get the answer. Sorry, I'll get it. Great, thanks, Jane. And I'll just give the questions a few more minutes, um, but up here on the screen, if you guys need to be added to the operator meeting email that I send out every week, you can email me anytime and I'll add you. And then the next operator meeting is next Tuesday, March the 2nd. And someone emailed me topics for that, but I haven't seen that email yet. I just saw the pre-header. So um, I'll be sending that out sometime on Thursday or Friday, probably Friday.
Oh, dang. Thank you. No, I appreciate picking us. Thank you very much. Actually, somebody noticed that I had 2020 on like every single one of the agendas. So I went back and changed all those. Um, thank you to the guy that pointed that out to me. Appreciate that. I like to be correct. This one is too. <laughs> so there's a question. There's a question about the form 2B and another question about the form 9. Okay. So the form nine might be released before the end of this week. If not, it'll be released next week. The form 2B um, is almost ready for staff to test it. So I would think a release of that is a week out. Um, and I do have a reminder, um, next Monday is March 1st. Um, so far we've received um, notification of intent to replace pending permits from a little over 20 operators. Um, so there are some operators who have permits, um, permit applications that were pending before the effective date of the new rules that have not um, sent us the spreadsheet yet for replacement. So just a reminder, you have between now and March 1st to do that, um, which is next Monday. Um, starting next Tuesday, March 2nd, uh, staff will start deleting uh, the old applications for which we have not been informed that you intend to replace them. If you inform us that you intend to replace them, they stay in there. And when the replacement is submitted, then they're deleted. Um, so just a heads up on that timing. Oh, where are things with the Form 2C? The Form 2C has been released. It should be available in eForms for everybody. Isn't that right, Greg? I believe that is right, Jane. Um, so if you don't see it in the drop-down selection in eForms, please let us know, but it should be there. I think there are some Form 2Cs in draft that operators have created, just haven't submitted yet. Um, remind me who the replacement APD list is to be sent to. Please send those lists to Penny Garrison and John Noto. Hannah, can you drive to our homepage? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just as a reminder of where to, <clears throat> where the tool is to help you prepare your list of applications to be replaced. Um, Hannah, if you click on permits, this is the pending permits page and just right there at the bottom, it says operator report. This um, will give you an Excel um, export of all of your pending form twos and two A's that were um, submitted prior to January 15th. And you can utilize that. Um, it actually has a column that says, do you intend to replace? Um, you can use that to prepare um, spreadsheets to email to Penny and John between now and through Monday. Thanks, Jane. All right, um, we'll give folks another few minutes um, to
to send in their questions. And I'll put my thing back up here. Here's my email address if you need to um, let me know that you are not on the operator list. Also, if you're not receiving operator emails from me at least once a week, um, you might want to check your spam folder. We are using a company called Constant Contact, and they also do a lot of sales stuff um, for other companies that need that usage. And so a lot of times the spam folder will snag it. <laughs> um, so that might be your issue. But if you're not on the list, just email me and let me know. And if you're not sure, email me and let me know and I can check and see. All right, well, I think that that pretty much wraps us up. Uh, next operator meeting is going to be next Tuesday, March the 2nd. Um, if you have any other questions, you can always go to the question portal and that's um, part of that email that I send you. There's a bunch of links in there um, that you can refer to if you are wondering where some things are. Um, but otherwise, thank you everyone for attending and hope you have a great day. That's me waving, you can't see it very well. Thanks, Hannah. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. All right, take care, everyone. Thanks, Hannah. And in the meeting for all.